Hey y'all, Jackie here, and welcome to Fantastical Follies, where we turn old things into new. Today, I'm going to show you how to make a reversible pair of Regency long stays using an old stained dress I found buried in my closet. Y'all know I love a good stash busting project, right? <laughs> I'll also go into detail about how you can find grain on a cut piece of fabric that doesn't have a selvage. Throughout history, fabric was often more expensive than labor, and it was a common practice to take apart old clothing in order to refashion it into something new. So when I couldn't find the right fabric in the color I wanted to make my Regency stays, I turned to my closet. I also pulled some lace out of my stash thinking it'd be cute to cover the gussets with it. I was going to dye some linen for the lining, but I had a mild disaster with my mullet stays, so I opted to just use the plain bleached white linen that I had in my stash. And then I thought, well, the lace looks good with the white linen too, so let's make these babies reversible. Editing Jackie here. I realize I never explained why I wanted to make these reversible in the first place, and that is because I'm afraid that if I ever make a Regency dress out of thin white muslin that the purple is going to show through, or worse, the purple and the lace is going to show through. So my thought is if I have a white side that I can flip over and wear, it'll make these stays much more utilitarian. That's not the word I'm looking for, but you all know what I mean, right? Also, I didn't mention that all of the supplies I'm using to make these stays, I pulled from my stash. So the dress, the lining, the boning, the binding, everything that I used was stuff I already have on hand. Even the lacing was left over from another project. So the cost of these stays for the materials is zero dollars. I didn't spend any money. I'm just stash busting the heck out of my life right now. And it is so awesome. The only thing I did pay for was the pattern. Regency is not necessarily an era I want to spend a lot of time in, but it's a great era to have in your back pocket. It's beginner friendly, uses small yardages of fabric, doesn't require a lot of extra underpinnings, <coughs> looking at you 18th century, and it's flattering on most figures. Plus it's one of those eras that's always popular. In addition, I'm using the red threaded Regency long stays pattern. I chose this particular pattern because it says these stays are appropriate for the years 1805 to 1830, which means these will do double duty for this project as well as my Halloween project this year, a bat themed gown from around 1830. Woohoo for multitasking. All right, let's get started making these stays. All right, here is the cut out pattern for these red threaded stays. I'm looking at this thinking, this ain't gonna fit me. It just looks so long. It's already been established how breaking short my waist is. Here is the waist point here. I'm gonna measure from here to here. I've already done this, but I wanna show you. From here to here is nine inches. Here are my 18th century stays. Here is the underarm, same point. This is the waist. We are at seven and a quarter. And this is up in my business as far as I would ever want it to be. If this goes up any further, it's uncomfortable. And even if I pull my straps tight, it's a little bit high. I'm just gonna go ahead and cut it. I mean, if this is a digital pattern, so I can reprint it if it doesn't work. So the only problem with shortening these stays is the busk. This is a 14 inch busk. If I shorten everything by two inches, I'm hoping that this is still gonna fit in this channel. We'll try it. I'm thinking it might be okay. Cause if you put this here, I mean, that's a two, that's two inches there. So maybe I'll cut this just slightly less. That's why we make a mock-up. Okay, so we need to make sure that the register marks still meet. So I think I'm just going to um, cut quarter of an inch above this line, which is the short stays cutting line. And I'm going to go up. Let's actually do one and a half inches here. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this line here that I just drew, right? Cause this is a quarter of an inch and we are going to place it there.
it just fits. It just fits. I might have to extend this bottom just a little bit zoop, like that, but we'll see. I'll play with that. I'll give myself a little extra space, but okay. I'm going to try this. I'm going to cut this out of some cheap muslin first and just see and make sure I'm not totally off base. And then we'll get started on the mock-up. Okay. This is day one of Stay's Venture. I have a dress. I bought this dress at the thrift store six or seven years ago. Wore it once to ACL. It's been in my closet ever since. And when I was looking around at fabric to make these stays, the fabric that I wanted was out of stock and I couldn't decide on a color. And then I found this thing in my closet. And at first I was like, hey, this is a cute dress. I'll wear it. But then I looked at it. I don't know how or why, but this thing is so stain to all get out. There are, and you probably can't see this, but there are like scuff marks under the bust. I'm pretty sure that's from like leaning against a barrier, knowing me. Um, and there's also little brown stains all over the place. And um, they don't show up too well on camera, as you can see in this footage. However, if you are looking at it in person, it is very obvious. And I did want to say a quick, huge shout out to Muse from Muse and Dionysus. They took the time to help me try and remove all of the stains from this. They had a lot of really good information and I really appreciate it. It wasn't enough to get the stains out. I have lightened them slightly, but after, I don't know, four or five washes and borax, it didn't come out like it's set in. So in any case, what I'm going to do is get my handy dandy seam ripper and rip this whole thing apart. Now the back is completely unstained. So I at least have this whole back. And I'm thinking, depending on which way the grain goes on this, and I haven't figured that out yet, I think the grain is going this way, um, I still may have enough fabric without the stains to get the full stays out of this. But the biggest and hardest task is going to be taking this apart. So I'm gonna go do that. Cross your fingers. It's all surged on the inside. And then there's this smocking that I have to deal with. So I'm not sure how long this is gonna take me. Hopefully not forever. I'll see y'all later. Okay, so I thought it might be cool to show you how I found the grain on these pieces of fabric that I have used that were already cut and made into a dress. This is a really handy skill to have when you're doing something like this where you're upcycling an old piece right into something new. So I did most of this the other night when I was actually seam ripping all of this and it wasn't until I finished the second half of the skirt that I was like, oh, maybe I should show you all this. So I am going to flip the camera and show you how I did it on the bodice pieces and then kind of explain what I did with the skirt. Okay, so here is the skirt piece. Here is the torn grain. And so you can tear with anything that is woven that is not super bubbly is kind of the word that I'm looking for. Like the linen that I've been using, right, for all of my historical projects, you wouldn't want to rip this. This wouldn't rip. Uh, or at least it wouldn't rip nicely on the grain because of the way it's woven. It's just super it's like loosely woven and stuff. That's why we pull a thread with linen. Don't rip linen. But for cotton and wool and also some silks, I believe, you can do this on it, okay? So here is the other side of the skirt. What I did was I cut like right along the seam allowance here and then I just ripped and it ripped a pretty nice straight line. Um, you could tell looking at this fabric that it is almost a rectangle. So it, it was pretty easy to rip this. How did I know to tear here? Well, that's just basic knowledge and experience of making a lot of garments. I make a lot of cotton skirts, a lot of cotton dresses, um, and have been for many years. And I know that when you're constructing these, you cut the center front on the fold of this of the selvage and uh, along the grain. So I knew that it was going to be an up and down for this, okay? And, and, and again, that was just me knowing like that's how, this isn't gonna be cut on the cross grain unless you're really strapped for fabric, which I have done before. Um, but in most cases, you know, you're dealing with something that's manufactured like this, it's going to be constructed the right way. So grain lines on skirts generally go up and down. You always wanna kind of go in a little bit from the from the seam allowance and give it a rip and see where it goes from there. You may need to cut off a bigger piece to get a whole straight all the way down, but in this case I did not because it was almost square anyway. 
okay? Here is the bodice back piece. Here's my straight grain, okay? And I, I sort of, to do this one, I sort of stretched it and found the least stretchy way. And again, this is a knowledge, like if the skirt is going up and down, this is probably going up and down. And that was true. And this was almost cut completely on a, on a straight grain. I did try this way first, cause I got a little back um, backwards. But like, if you were to pull that, you see how that is just threads coming off, it's not ripping that means you're not on the grain. And then here's the bodice front. Now, this is a little bit trickier, okay? Um, I know, again, from experience looking at this, that it is cut on the bias. And how do you know if it's something that's cut on the bias? Well, it stretches. If this is a non-stretchy fabric and it stretches, you see this is the bust here, like this is the center. So this is the center front here, right? This is the side. It's stretching this way. That is not on grain. Two, I put it up and down and it is still stretching. It is not on grain. That says to me, bias. So what I did was, again, I started at the seam allowance and I just kind of cut it and it tore real nicely right there. So that is the straight grain right there. So I'm actually gonna physically do this with the other two so that you can see how I did this. Here is the bodice back. This is already cut because of the way I cut things earlier. I'm gonna go ahead and tear that. That's not working. That's definitely not the grain. Okay, well, let's stretch it. Is it? No, it's not stretching. So that tells me probably we're looking at an up and down. So I'm gonna take my scissors and I'm just gonna give it a little snip. And then you do wanna put a little force behind it. You don't wanna super tear it super hard in case it grooves things up, but you do wanna give it a little bit of force. Well, that's not right either. Okay, also not right. Maybe I just didn't cut in far enough. There we go, that's what I wanted to see. And do you see how easy that was? It just went, once you get the initial force, it just comes off. So here is my straight grain for this piece. Okay, and again, this one. And the reason I didn't try and tear from this side is just because there's more space over here. And this is the seam allowance, so it's already a little funky and stressed. So it just seemed like a natural point for me to cut. And so I am going to cut this way first. There we go. You see how easy that was? That's the grain. I will say like, that's not a very big piece to go by. So I'm gonna go just a little bit further in here and I'm just gonna give it a pull. That's a little bit better. That's how you find grain. Howdy folks. This is mock-up number two and try-on number two. So I did a first preliminary mock-up using just plain muslin and tried it on. Um, it was okay, but I decided to make the bust gussets a little bit larger and enlarge them by a quarter of an inch on the long sides. Couple of issues. One is really obvious. Every single freaking time. And it's bad on this side too, but it's not quite as bad um, because this shoulder is actually lower, like I slope this way. What I'm going to do is cut it off here. The pattern shows that the plus sizes are built like that where you can take the strap off. So I'm just gonna do that. That way I can move the strap in this way to accommodate my super narrow back. Hopefully that'll stop them falling off of my shoulders. That way I think I can have an easier time getting this pattern cut out of this dress while avoiding the stains because I think that I'm gonna have a hard time getting everything cut and avoid the stains with the straps on the back piece like that. Change number two I need to do is this problem. Even with the busk in, it's like crumpling. I am getting a little bit of wrinkling at the waist. I don't know if that's just because it's gonna do that or if I need to shorten the waist a little bit. I'm not having that issue in the front. It looks fine in the front. So I don't know. Um, one other change I'm going to do, I'm not gonna do it on this mock-up, but so if you can see, I have extended the busk pocket down. I actually made the busk pocket the length it was originally because it wasn't quite long enough to accommodate the busk after I had shortened it for my waist. So what I'm gonna do on the real pattern is extend the front of the stays down to accommodate that extra length. I meant to do it with the mock-up and just forgot. Alrighty, I have made a couple of modifications. One, I have brought this up slightly. That has helped with the wrinkling here at the sides. Two, um, I have been problem solving with the weird wrinkling happening here with the busk. I have fixed it quite a lot, partially because I actually sewed the busk channel correctly. I 
only eyeballed it when I put this mock-up together. I was rushing, I'm, I'm not gonna lie. That helped a lot. Um, someone also suggested that I adjust where the gussets start. Um, if you look, I have lowered this one by half an inch. I think it is looking a little bit better than this one. Plan is I'm going to construct it as normal with the gussets in this spot, try it on, and if I'm getting the wrinkling, then I can cut in and lower the gussets. That way I can make sure everything is well put together and on grain and that is not the issue before I cut any holes in this. The other thing I changed is I cut off the straps and moved them all the way to the back. Huge help. To fix the waist length, I drew with chalk onto my seam, making sure that it covered each side of the line. Then I ripped it open and took the measurement between the lines, which turned out to be about three quarters of an inch at its largest. On the paper pattern, I drew a line where I needed the cut to start and moved everything up the decided amount. I repeated this for each piece. Then because I'm not shortening the center front, I slanted the bottom of the pattern to cover the distance. For the bodice front, I marked where the busk channel needed to go and drew a diagonal line from the side seam. Then I adjusted the curve slightly to follow the current curve of the pattern. Then I cut my inner lining layer. I'm using the brown herringbone linen scrap that I used as the interlining on my mullet stays. I probably should have opted for white herringbone linen given how light my fabric was, but I had to choose between using that for this or my 17th century stays, and those are fully boned. And as we all know, you can't mark on this fabric, so the lower boned option was it. And then I cut out on the real fabric. Ugh. I ended up having to use only the two skirt pieces. I'm carefully cutting out each individual piece, making sure to avoid the stains. I did screw up a little and cut one of the pieces on the stain, but it's mostly on the seam allowance on the back, so I'm not gonna shed a tear about it. Off camera, I also cut out my lining. I have surged the side edges of both my lining and my interlining. I did not do the top or the bottom, though I would have liked to because we're only dealing with a quarter inch seam allowance here and it's going to be bound. So if I surged it, you would see the surging on the outside. So I did not surge the tops and the bottoms. This is the busk pocket. I realized I didn't actually need to cut one out of the fashion fabric. I only needed to cut one out of the lining and the interlining. I went ahead and surged those two pieces together for later. Now it is time to make a gusset sandwich. I bet those are two words you never thought you would hear in a sentence together. All right, so to make these sandwiches, we're gonna take the fashion fabric and put it on top of the interlining. And then we're gonna take the lining and put it on the back of the interlining. Then I'm gonna take one piece of lace and put it on the outside, get rid of fuzzies, and then flip it and put a piece of lace on the other side and then carefully pin it together. The reason I'm doing it this way is because this lace is very slippery and I want to make sure that I keep this as even as possible, especially for the bus gussets. From here, I'm going to baste in the center really big basting stitches to keep it flat. Don't trust pins for this. All right, now I'm going to very, very carefully run this through my serger. Starting here, I'm gonna work my way down. I'm going to do the point separately and then I'll come back up and very carefully go up the side. I'm gonna leave this open because if there's any excess, I can trim very easily from here. All right, so I will trim all of my little edges and remove my basting stitches. All right, so I'm gonna do this to the rest of them and then I will iron them flat so that they are nice and neat. Time for one of my lovely night shoots. I wanted to make sure that I had the gusset marks perfect. So I took the pattern and cut off the seam allowance on the long sides, leaving the top portion intact so I could line it up perfectly with the gusset. Then I used a friction pen to draw the stitch line on the outside. I did test the iron on the lace to make sure the friction pen would disappear before I made this decision. 
And then I set about flatlining my fashion fabric to my inner lining. I'm opting to create my boning channels between these two layers rather than buy a bunch of boning casing like the pattern says. Definitely a little less sturdy considering the fabric I'm using, but much faster. So I cut a layer out of my fashion fabric for no reason. Rats! Rather than waste it, I basted it onto my interlining to serve as a temporary busk pocket until I finish my stays. Here you can also see my sewn boning channels and the stay stitching I did for each busk gusset. Here's a quick look at the flatline straps and the side pieces with their boning and gusset stay stitching. It's about here where I realize I've made a mistake. The pattern wants you to make the two boning channels around the grommets by folding a portion back and stitching them together. But as you can see here, because I'm doing two layers of fabric, it's really thick. What the heck was I thinking? Cut it out. Then I surged the edge and pressed it to the inside. All right, time for the hard part, the gussets. First, cut through the middle of your stay stitching, then roll the stay stitching to the back and iron. Pin the gusset on the right side from the bottom of the point up being careful to follow the stitch line. Make sure that your seam allowance is tucked under and secured. Trust me when I say you'll want to do it now and not in the middle of stitching this. It's okay if the top of the gusset is above the rest of the stays. That's to be expected. I'm going to base these down first to make sure my gusset points are at the right spot. Next, do the same to the side hip gussets. Top stitch close to the edge through all layers, then do another top stitch a scant eighth of an inch away. The front hip gussets are a little weirder. Pin to the front with right sides together, then pin the other side of the gusset to the side piece, being sure to pin right on the stitch lines. Then stitch the gusset down from the wrong side. Once that's secure, at the very point of the gusset, pin the front piece to the side piece. Then stitch the steam. Don't try to sew the gusset and the side seam in one go. All right, folks, that's the hard bit taken care of. From there, pin the backs to the sides and stitch her down. Off camera, I basted the strap linings onto the straps and attached the straps to the stays. Then it was time to mark the back for your eyelets. I'm opting for the more historically accurate method of spiral lacing because it's easier to get on by yourself. I'm setting the eyelets one and a half inches apart and taking care to make sure my dot is right in the center of the channel. Here's where my process gets a little weird. I'm cutting off the excess lining from the back, the fold over part I'm not using. This is so I can make the eyelets free of the lining. I then pinned it to my back over where the eyelets would go and surged the back edge for stability. The long raw edge will get tucked under and whip stitched down later. I then marked the additional boning channels that are adjacent to the side and front seams that split the front side gusset, stitched them down and ironed off my markings. Time to brave the Texas heat and round off one side of my boning edges. I'm using 3 8 inch zip ties here and used regular old sandpaper to smooth the edges down. Whoops, ironed off my eyelet marker there. All right, I thought I'd take a minute here and show you why I have decided not to follow the instructions completely for these stays. The pattern actually asks to flatline everything and add boning channels into the stays instead of the more historically adequate way of interlining fashion fabric putting the boning channels in there, binding everything together, and then adding the lining last, like I did with my mullet stays. There is a very specific reason I'm doing that. And let's welcome to the stage, Taco Bell. So this is a costume I've talked about a lot on this channel. Uh, definitely one of my favorite makes I've ever done. She was so fun to make. She was so fun to wear out, but things have changed and she no longer fits me. I have, taken the task of taking her in so that I can wear her again. And unfortunately, it's given me some issues because the lining has been grommeted 
to the rest of the structure of the corset. Now this is a modern corset. It is not historically inspired at all. This is just a completely modern make. Um, and so I followed the modern making instructions for this, given that, you know, most modern makes don't take into consideration that our bodies changed. And so as I started to alter this, I ran into some issues. First of all, because this is poly satin and it's awful to work with, but mostly because as you can see here, I can't turn this completely right side in because the lining is grommeted <laughs> to the rest of the corset. And having to go in and change these channels and take these channels in with this hindering my abilities has been an absolute nightmare. And unfortunately, because it's been so hard and because she's never gonna look the same as she did before I started to take her apart, I'm never going to be able to alter her again because it's just too much work. This is why I'm gonna lay in the lining last. I am going to put a strip on the back of the stays where the eyelets are going to go so that I can remove the lining if I ever need to adjust these stays to fit my changing body. It's a lot of extra work and I don't have a lot of time to get this done, but in the long run, after going through this absolute nightmare, it's going to be well worth it. Howdy folks. All right, I've been wearing this for about two hours-ish. Um, I ate, I did the dishes, and I'm pretty comfortable. Still running into some issues. Obviously, you can still see that this is wrinkling. And I had another response from another person who is also large chested, who did this same pattern and had the same problem. Um, this person reached out to Red Threaded and nobody could really give them a final answer about how to fix the problem. So it just sounds like this is the nature of this pattern. If you are larger chested, you're gonna get weird wrinkling. So I have become zen with the fact that these stays aren't going to be perfect. I am getting some wrinkling other places. It's not horrible. The sad fact is that I have two weeks to get this finished and make the entire Regency gown and the zombie over gown and the brain reticule before I get to costume college. So I'm comfortable. I can move. I can bend. I'm going to go with this for now. I never expected this to be perfect. I never expected this project to look as good as my mullet stays. Um, otherwise I'd be using different materials. So as long as I'm comfortable, that's what matters at this point. So I'm going to go ahead and get the rest of this put together. One note, I am going to lower the bus gussets slightly and then I'm gonna start getting it prepped and ready to put the binding on. On my body, I marked where I thought the point of the gusset should be. Then I remarked the stitch lines on the gussets before removing my basting stitches. Then it was just a matter of slashing down to my new mark and repinning to the points before top stitching the gussets down. I also sewed down my straps permanently and pressed them down toward the bodice. I then turned under my eyelet lining and pressed. Notice I did the eyelets through all three layers of fabric. This surged outer edge will get whip stitched down. Now to trim all the excess fabric from the top of the gussets. We're getting close y'all. I basted down the top edge of the stays to keep everything neat and tidy. Now it's time for the binding. This isn't nearly as complicated as the binding on my mullet stays. I start by pinning down the center backs. Once those get sewn down, then I'll go back and pin the tops and bottoms before sewing those down as well. Red Threaded explains how to do this on the machine, but I'm not that brave, so it'll all get hand stitched. And then it was time to do some hand stitching. Look, it's daylight. I did this just for y'all. As you can see in this close up, I've decided to fully line my straps and bind them down. This is to accommodate the eyelets. The curve is a little tricky, but with some wiggling around, you can get a pretty nice turn, even if you're not using tape that stretches.
Time for the lining. I sewed my back seams and then pinned down the side seams only to the gusset point and stitched. To get the lining neatly around the gussets, I went ahead and cut down the gusset lines on both the hips and the bust. Then I turned under the seam allowance on all of the cuts as well as the side seam. Then I pinned down the busk pocket and stitched close to each edge. With that done, I could finally take off my pseudo busk pocket. Finally, I carefully pinned down the lining to the back side of the stays, taking extra care around all of the gores. Off camera, I then went ahead and hand stitched the lining down using a whip stitch. Then with a quick iron, she was done and ready to wear. And there you have it. 
an upcycled reversible pair of Regency long stays. Now, these stays are nowhere near perfect. In retrospect, I think that the cotton fabric from the dress was just a little too loosely woven to handle being the fashion fabric for stays. They're wrinkling pretty hard in places, and <laughs> that weird gusset wrinkle thing is bizarre. But that's okay. They're comfortable and they give me the right silhouette. That's the important thing. Editing Jackie back again. Ha, ah, you thought you were done with me, didn't you? I wanted to say after I filmed the reveal, looking back, I think that the white side of the stays look a lot better. There's a lot less wrinkling happening there. There's still some wrinkling happening, but there's a lot less. Okay, back to scripted Jackie. If I was going to be spending more time in this era, I'd fuss about getting it perfect, but I only have one other Regency look planned, and that's an if I ever have time sort of thing. If down the line I get bit by the Regency bug, I'll probably make a pair of short stays instead. Coming up in two weeks is the next portion of this project. I'm going to be making a short-sleeved Regency gown based on a fashion plate that I found and loved. Then in a separate video, I'm going to make a zombie overlay dress and the famed brain reticule. So if you enjoyed this video and want to see more content like this, remember to hit that like button and subscribe if you haven't. These little things go a huge way into getting my weird little channel seen and also help the algorithm find more content for you. Thank you all so much for watching. I appreciate each and every one of you for making it this far. As this video airs, I'll be on my way to costume college, which I'm making this outfit for. Once I get back, I have a lot of things planned, both for this project as well as for lead up to Cozy 2022. Get excited y'all and don't forget that Cozy happens on Instagram as well as YouTube. So if you're not following me over there, go ahead and do so. My handle is Fantastical Follies Costuming, all one word, and I'm going to be hosting the Red Carpet Gala over there. And that's about it for me y'all. Leave me a comment down below and tell me about an old item of clothing you've been holding on to for a while that you'd like to upcycle into something else. I'll catch y'all later. And the brain, brain, bread. What I'm going to do is take this. All right, we'll wait for the motorcycle to go away. Okay. And I'm going to be hosting the Red Cop. Red Cop at Gala. I sound like I'm from New England. I bet those are two words you never thought you would hear in a sentence together.